Hey everyone, it's Matt. Today we're going to think a little bit about correlation, the idea being that we're starting off our unit on correlation and regression. So the point of these topics is to think about relationships now between two or more variables. So, so far in the course we've been mostly looking at one particular variable and trying to understand its mean or proportions or standard deviation. Now we're going to think about two variables and see uh, how they relate. So the idea behind this is that we can hypothesize a model, we can make a suggestion about how we think the variables are related, and then we'll use some statistics to see if that model fits. If the model does happen to be a good fit, then we can use it uh, to go ahead and make some predictions. So let's think about this first example here. So you may be interested in predicting uh, failure times of overloaded resistors. Uh, perhaps maybe you're uh, given some ohms and you want to predict the time in minutes that the resistor will fail. We will consider that time, so we're interested in predicting the time as a function of the resistance. Uh, so that's important for us here. You can imagine a couple of different things happening. Uh, so if the two if ohms and minutes happen to be correlated, uh, perhaps when we draw a xy scatter plot, we'll be able to see some kind of relationship. So in the first two graphs here, we have some positive linear relationships. Uh, the second one here is perfect. All of these points fall into a straight line. Uh, this is some idealized scenario that we don't really expect to happen in the real world. Uh, the first picture here uh, is a little more realistic. There is some noise, there is some scatter, but it seems that as x goes up, y is also going up. It's some positive linear relationship. Analogously, down below, we have a perfect negative linear correlation with this line here, and just a regular negative linear correlationship here, again with some scatter. Now there's more to life than just linear relationships. A lot of different things can happen. You can look at this graph here, where we see that there's just no correlation between x and y. It's completely noise. If I give you a particular x value here on the axis, you will have a difficult time predicting what the corresponding y will be. Uh, based on this data, it looks like y could be anything. It could be really small, really big. No real correlation going on here. Uh, but we also have examples of correlations that are not linear. So this is an example of a nonlinear correlation. Uh, there are many different shapes, many different kinds of curves you could try to fit to your data. We'll focus just on lines. We won't talk so much about nonlinear relationships, but they do exist. So when it comes to thinking about linear relationships, we are going to need a linear correlation coefficient, r. So r measures the strength of the linear relationship. This relationship might be strong, it might be weak, it might not exist, it might be perfect. There are many options. Uh, sometimes this is called a Pearson uh, coefficient here, and it's given by this unpleasant formula for r here. Uh, we won't actually need to use this. You can use functions in r. Uh, to compute, it just goes through and crunches this formula for you. Uh, but we can use this r here to understand the correlation of our sample. So this r, r here is a statistic. It's relating to a particular sample that we might have of our population. The corresponding uh, parameter is rho, so this is the Greek letter rho. Uh, this is the population parameter. So for the entire population, rho describes how they are related, whereas r describes how the data points in our sample are related that we collected. There are, as usual, a couple of assumptions to do this. So we always want the data to be coming from random sample. 
uh, that is fine. Uh, we have a new one here. We will insist that the pairs have a bivariate normal distribution. Uh, this is a word we haven't heard before. Basically, it's described here. Uh, it means basically that x and y are both normal. Or rather, for a given value of x, the corresponding y's we might expect are normal, uh, and vice versa. For any given y, the values of x that we expect will also be normal. Uh, this is a reasonably fair uh, assumption, depending on which kind of data you're working with. So let's continue here and look at some of the properties of this new coefficient r. So r here is always a value between minus 1 and 1. Uh, r equals 0 corresponding to no correlation, 1 and minus 1 being very strong, uh, or perfect correlations actually in that case. Uh, this value of r doesn't uh, change if you maybe scale the axes a little bit. So your scatter plot, you can make a scatter plot look deceptive by scaling the axes in unusual ways. Uh, R is impervious to all this. The formula uh, gets rid of that for you. So it doesn't matter how you measure x and y, R will always be the same. And it's also symmetric uh, about switching x and y. So it doesn't matter which is your x-axis, which is your y. You can flip the axes. R will still remain the same. Point number four here is important. Our R is measuring the strength of a linear relationship, just linear. It doesn't measure the strength of any relationship that is not linear. So you should only apply this if you believe a linear relationship exists. For this reason, you should plot your x and y scatter first see if the data looks linear, or if you have some reason to expect it to be linear, then you can go and compute R to investigate the strength of this linear relationship. Uh, step five here uh, has a lot of the meat of R. So we have these R equals one and R equals negative one. So these are the perfectly uh, positive and negative linear correlations. When r is positive, the correlation is positive. When r is negative, the correlation is negative. That's not so surprising. The value right in the middle here is 0. This is no correlation, so this is the picture of noise that we saw. You are not able to use x in order to predict y. And for values in between, say between 0 and 1, we have some kind of positive relationship here. The closer we are to 1, the stronger it gets. There's no cut and dry rule about what determines a strong or weak or no relationship. It does vary a little bit by field, but the closer to one, the stronger it gets. Maybe at this point, let's go back and look at some of the graphs again with the idea that we can uh, maybe get some intuition of what they look like. So the perfect positive linear correlation here, that's going to have an R of one and the negative will have a corresponding r of negative 1. And for context here, uh, the positive linear correlation here with a little bit of noise, this corresponds to an r of 0.8. And the corresponding negative linear relationship here corresponds to an r equals negative 0.8. So this is about what 0.8 looks like. As the r decreases, uh, the scatter will increase. The deviations from the line will get bigger. OK, we can also maybe turn quickly to these two functions here. So the no correlation, just the noise, that has r equals 0. x and y have nothing to do with each other. You cannot use x to predict y. Whereas in this other case, where we have uh, the nonlinear correlation existing, uh, in this case, uh, that's the wrong question, actually, to ask about r. You should not use r in this case should not use r. You should take your data, throw it into a plot, say, ah, I think I have a nonlinear relationship, try and come up with some model that describes this curve here, and then use that kind of a function uh, to fit. And there are other methods to evaluate how good it is. So in terms of thinking about linear relationships, we should always make sure that you see a relationship on the xy plot before you go ahead and investigate r. So let's make sure we see that.
If the relationship's not linear, it doesn't really make much sense to consider the R. You can do that with an xy scatter plot. Maybe xy plot in R. Okay, let's jump back now to where we were in the notes. Uh, we should make an important note about this important note here. Uh, so correlation does not reply, uh, imply that one variable is causing the other. This is a fancy way of saying correlation does not imply causation. Uh, this is a typical pitfall. You can get yourself into a lot of trouble uh, conflating the notion of correlation and causation. Just because two things happen to be well correlated doesn't mean there's some sort of causal inference between the two of them. There could be, uh, but there also could not be. It could be random chance, or there could be some other third confounding variable that is leading to the result that you see in the data. So for example, example two here, uh, it is the case that uh, shoe size, uh, size of a person's foot, uh, is actually quite well correlated with the height of the person. Uh, that doesn't mean there's some causation here. That doesn't mean if uh, your foot is large, then you will be tall. If we uh, did something to increase the size of your foot, we stretched it, uh, modified it in some way, that, that doesn't result in you becoming taller. Uh, it just happens that both of these things are being controlled by some other third variable, probably to do with your genetics or hormones as a child, something, something in your DNA. Okay, so let's now go back to this example involving ohms and minutes here for the overloading circuits. So we have an X variable here, we'll call that our resistance, and we have a Y value here, that's our failure time in minutes. So what we're thinking about here is imagining that we'd like to try and predict the failure time based on x, the resistance in ohms. So you can imagine having a bunch of data here. Maybe you do a sample, you collect a bunch of x's, you collect a bunch of y's. The first step is going to be to plot them to see what they look like. So step one is to plot the pairs. Uh, you might be expecting a linear relationship, but you should take a look at what the data is showing you. Uh, we've plotted it over here. It does look like there's some kind of linear relationship going on here. It looks positive to me as resistance goes up. Failure time also seems to be going up. Uh, you could imagine trying to draw some sort of line of best fit. It might go something like that. Uh, we can have R produce this line for us, and we'll talk more about that in class. For now, uh, let's try and find this R value, our correlation coefficient. So you could use the unpleasant formula earlier, or this is such a common thing that R has some built-in functions that we can use. So in order to do this practically, we would load x and y into some vectors. So let's put x, uh, let's use our c function here to put in all of the x data. So let's load the x data into one, uh, and we'll load the y value into y here, again using c. It's important that the values come in order. The second value of x needs to be the matching one with the second value of y. Same order is important. Once you have it in this form, you can use the core function, cor in r, giving it x then y, and this will give you your I, r value. So I tried this earlier, and so this one's about 0.77 have some decimal places here. We'll use this for a calculation later. And so this is definitely looking to be uh, like a positive linear relationship between uh, the resistance in ohms and the failure time in minutes. So let's press on. The last thing we're going to do in this video is to construct some kind of formal hypothesis test 
So we could have done this at the start of the year. We could have said, oh, let's plot x, let's plot y, let's find the correlation coefficient, let's get r. But the problem with that is that we would like to determine whether this r was produced by some random chance, or if we can actually reject uh, maybe the hypothesis that there is no r. So we can somehow determine that there is a significant relationship between our variables here. So now that we have the technology of hypothesis testing, we can go ahead and perform a hypothesis test on the correlation between these two variables. So the idea here is to set up a null hypothesis involving rho. So we have two uh, populations. They might be correlated. That correlation coefficient is rho. What we've measured is r. We know what r is. Let's use r to make some inference about rho to determine whether or not it's 0, or if we can say, subject to some tolerance, that it's definitely not 0. We can use the following test statistic. So we need another one. We have many test statistics. This one is a t-value here involving r and n. Notes that the degrees of freedom is n minus 2. We have now x, y pairs, so n minus 2 instead of n minus 1. And it's a t statistic, so we're going to be using the t distribution. So you can use the pt and qt functions in R to work with this. n here uh, needs to be clarified. There could be some confusion here. n isn't the total number of uh, sort of points altogether. This is the total number of pairs. So n here is the number of pairs, uh, or number of paired x and y's values. OK, so let's see example four. Let's see this in practice and go through the steps and try to understand if there really is a significant linear relationship between our resistance and failure time. So let's get this started here. So let's have step one. This is a formal hypothesis test, so we'll go through all eight of our steps. Let's first establish the claim. Uh, let's claim, how about we claim that rho is not zero. We think that there is a relationship here. In words, that would mean to say there is a significant linear correlation. OK, let's, with our claim in hand, establish our null and alternative hypothesis. So H0, in these uh, correlation hypothesis tests, H0 is always rho equals 0. You want to know if the correlation is significant or not. And for our alternative, that happens to be our claim here. We're claiming that it's not zero. We're saying that there is a particular relationship, uh, a significant linear relationship. And this is the original claim. Is HA. OK, let's press on. Let's think about step three. The tolerance is set for us. We're going to be using an alpha of 5%, common alpha to use. Let's proceed to step four. So let's think about our assumptions. These are not explicitly stated. Uh, the data was taken from some experiment that was done, as long as there was nothing wrong going there, uh, it should be a random sample. So let's assume it's a random sample. Uh, let's assume that. The other thing is that x and y need to have bivariate normal distributions. Uh, 
this is often the case. Uh, it's okay to assume that. Let's assume this is true. Okay, uh, with that in mind, let's go ahead and compute our test statistic. Now let's get our t value here. So I'll just copy the formula from above. We're going to be using this r value as well as our n minus 2 and lots under the square root down here. So we have these things. Let's fill them in. Seven 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 three five eight squared. And if you count them up, if you count up the number of data points, we had twelve. Uh, this actually, this term here is degrees of freedom, twelve minus two. Uh, I crunched this earlier, and we get about three point nine. T values should also always come with a degree of freedom. In this case, the degrees of freedom is ten. It's twelve minus two for us. So now that we have our statistic, uh, we can decide whether to do p-value method or traditional method. Let's uh, just stick to traditional. Both are fine and will yield the same result. Let's determine our rejection region. So this problem, based on our alternative hypothesis, it contains does not equal sign. This is a two-tailed problem. We have this does not equal appearing. So it's our intention to put an alpha over 2 in each tail. So we can imagine the schematic like this. So here's our t distribution. We have our fail to reject region in the middle. If the t value is sufficiently extreme, we will reject in these tails and we'll put 2.5% in each. You can compute these critical t values. Uh, you can do this by means of the qt function, qt. So for the one on the right side here, you can throw in 97.5% along with 10 degrees of freedom, and that will give you this 2.228 value for the critical t. Uh, this negative t crit, t distribution symmetric, this one is the same. You could compute it, but we already know it's going to be negative 2.228. Okay, with the rejection region established, we can go ahead and make some kind of decision in step seven. Let's decide how this is going to go. The t value we computed, this 3.8603, uh, this is bigger than 2.2 over here. This is in the rejection region. And so let's reject the null hypothesis. Okay, let's summarize and form a careful sentence. Uh, we're rejecting the null hypothesis here. Uh, originally, we had claimed that the alternative hypothesis, that was our original claim. So you can check on the table, or with enough practice, you can intuit this. So we've assembled a lot of data. Uh, we do have sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. And in this way, uh, we can support our initial claim. So the sample data that we've assembled These support the claim. Our original claim being that there is a linear correlation between resistance and failure time. Uh, we might say correlation, actually. 
So there's a significant linear relationship. We know there's a linear correlation subject to 5% alpha. Here between resistance and failure time. Good. OK, that's it for this video. Head over to D2L, try the quiz, and we'll see you in class for some regression.